Hey everyone, we have Apurva here today. She is the AI developer advocate with MongoDB and she's been working in data science for a very long time and we want to hear her journey, how she got into data science, what it's like to be working in AI. It's a hot topic right now. So we're really excited to have her over here. Can you first share a little bit about yourself? I'm Apurva. I'm currently an AI developer advocate at MongoDB, a data scientist turned developer advocate. I spent about six years working at the intersection of data science and cybersecurity. And now I help other developers be successful at building AI applications. Can you start us off by telling us a little bit about what got you into AI and machine learning? That's what everyone wants to get into too. Yeah. So share your story. Oh God, <laughs> I'm going to have to go all the way back to high school because that's where it really started. High school is when I wrote my first piece of code. I had an elective computer applications with all these like lead code kind of problems, which was scary. So when it was time to pick my major, I'm like kind of scared of computer science at this point. I'm going to go to electrical engineering. So I spent about four years doing that. I'm not really feeling as passionate about it. So that's when I took a machine learning course. That's when people, everyone around me was saying like, that's the next big thing. It's the hot thing to get into right now. So I'm like, okay, let's see what the fuss is all about. So took the course. Um, I was coding in Python finally, which was way more uh, easier to like code in. And I spent the next nine months doing a thesis working in the natural language processing domain. And that's kind of when I got a better feel for what it might look like to work in that field and 400 applications and cold emailing a director at a security company uh -huh. decided to give me a shot. And yeah, that's how I got into ML and cybersecurity. So was it really 400 applications? It was a lot. Yeah. Like I had only what? like less than a year of experience mm -hmm. in AI machine learning. And I was a fresh grad. I tried to leverage as many referrals as I could. And beyond that, it was just like cold emailing and applying to every single thing that came my way. I think that's really encouraging for the audience to hear that Hopefully. even with the master's degree, you still had to do a lot of cold emailing, yeah. a lot of cold applications. Yeah. And after 400 plus applications, you did become a data scientist and you're here. <laughs> yeah. So it is possible. It is. And yeah. I don't think it gets super easy. Like even I've switched, what, two more jobs since then. Or even after like five or six years of experience, a lot of times it just ends up being like applying and putting yourself out there. So your master's in computer engineering, right? Yeah. But you didn't go on to PhD, you stopped at master's. What is the difference between master's and PhD? And do you need to get a PhD as master's degree? Degree sufficient. Okay, let's start with the second question okay. first. Like, is it sufficient? Mm -hmm. Six years in and the kind of roles I've been in, I would say it's sufficient. And I've mostly been in applied machine learning roles where I'm applying machine learning to a problem. What I've seen is if you have like good engineering chops, you have basic machine learning concepts down enough to decide, do I even need machine learning to solve this problem? Or if you're training models, then being able to say whether your models are good or bad and having that little bit of in inclination for research and experimentation, I think it's sufficient and you can have a pretty successful career. And if you were to get into a more research focused algorithmic role where you're like building net new mo models like foundational models right now or like coming up with new training algorithms then maybe a more statistical deeper mathematical background would be more important but I, I would say first choose what is it you want to do like do you want to go more towards the algorithmic side of things or like applied side of things if it's applied I would even say like out of school as soon as you can so you can actually like expose yourself to real data sets and problems in the real world. For people who are maybe more interested in getting into research, you might look more into higher education like master's or PhD. You yourself worked as a research scientist at FireEye for a while. So titles are so weird in this industry, right? They called me a research scientist, but I was essentially a data scientist. Oh, that okay. We also had a software engineer on our team and they called them a researcher. I think like even if you're an applied data scientist, you still need a little bit of research. Yeah, if you're training pro uh, models to solve a particular problem, you still need to do the research to like try out a few things and then mm. uh, evaluate which one's working best for the problem you're trying to solve. So in that sense, whether you're a data scientist, 
research scientist or even a machine learning engineer, all these different titles, I think you need to have a bit of an inclination and readiness to experimentation and research. It sounds like there is a lot of overlap. <laughs> titles can be different for every company oh, and yeah. every environment. For sure. But in your general experience, tell us more about the difference between research and AI machine learning engineering. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about like whenever you have a scientist in your title versus machine learning engineer, right? So in my experience, if you're a data scientist, research scientist, then you're mostly working with training models, prototyping, evaluating them. If you're working more on the product data science kind of things, machine learning engineers worry more about like the training infrastructure itself, getting the data in a place where data scientists can then like train models efficiently. It's also heavily dependent on the size of your team, right? Like if you're a small team, which I was on when I started, then there's no distinction really. You're going to do like the full stack machine learning. If you have a bigger team, then yeah, there might be more of a distinction between. Yeah, that's really helpful. Even in the comments, I, I see sometimes people are like, that is not what data scientists yeah. is. Well, maybe <laughs> at your company. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. Not, it's but... a very different situation. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Because there's so much variations of the different titles and responsibilities, <laughs> it's easier to understand with more realistic examples. So can you share an example of a recent data science project you've worked on? One of the most recent projects I worked at Elasticsearch, where I was a data scientist on their security team, was this concept of entity risk scoring. So entities in security context is a user like you and me, who's just like working on a laptop or your laptop is an entity or a workstation, we call it or servers or database or basically any distinct thing that's part of a larger organization as an entity. Usually in cybersecurity attacks, there's a malicious entity at play. Me and my team built this statistical scoring logic where we would assign an entity risk score and risk level of like low, medium, high to uh, entities in an organization based on their behavioral patterns. That leads me okay. to a question. Project example that you just mentioned sounds more specifically a cybersecurity type of a project. That's also another field that requires a lot of domain-specific knowledge. Sure. Pretty difficult to get into. Yeah. So you, you got into both. Yeah. <laughs> both really <laughs> difficult did. industries. How did you get into cybersecurity? Was so cyber it was an accident too, right? Like Because I was <laughs> like applying to every position that came my way. One of the referrals I had was at the cybersecurity companies. I ended up working for a security wow. company. I was working on their email security teams. And the good thing about security is you can come to it from a lot of different backgrounds. There's always like subject matter experts who can assist you to like get that little bit of domain knowledge and be successful at your job. I mean, you could stay in school forever, but who knows what's going to change. Yeah, you know, yeah. Try to get a job. Yeah. And while you're working in the industry, you can always learn new things and exactly. maybe new opportunities will come, yeah. come your way if you're in the industry. So this yeah. is, is a great example of what I I like to tell people Definitely. About. And I think there's also this thing to be said about like being a specialist versus generalist, right? Mm -hmm. If you spend enough time doing one thing, then you kind of like pinhole yourself mm -hmm. in that direction. When you're early in your career, mm -hmm. you want to like experiment with a few yeah. different things, unless you know for sure that, hey, I want to do this one thing. That, I recently read this book called Range. They looked at all the pro soccer players. Okay. And they found out that majority of them did not even start soccer until like their 20s. Oh, wow. <laughs> what? So they dabbled in all, a lot of different types of sports. Nice. And then they later on figured out, I think I, I'll get into soccer uh, later on. I didn't think you could do that with sport. That's the, the misconception, which is, I think, similar to software engineering. People think, unless I've been like coding since I was 10, because like my dad got my first computer when I was six, oh, yeah, you yeah. know? <laughs> Oh my I can't God. be a software engineer. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. <laughs> and I think that's what, like, for a long time, I'm like, oh, if I'm scared in high school, obviously yeah. I'm never going to be able to do computer science. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. I think it's good to dabble in different types of projects mm -hmm. and then try to, like, figure out what you're into and for what sure. you're good at. Yeah. Now you have been working as an AI developer advocate. 
Right. Tell us more about this role. What does this mean? I'm still a data scientist, but now I've added like this education element to it. Basically, I'm helping AI developers figure out how to successfully integrate MongoDB in their AI applications. The way I'm doing that is via educational content, written content, or like hands-on workshops. That sounds really fun. Yeah, I- I've been enjoying it. Okay, so last question. A lot of people are really interested in getting into AI. What do you think is an important skill that's essential to be working in AI and machine learning field? I think given how things are going right now, I would say like adaptability is like Uh. the biggest thing, right? Being resistant to change or like preparing for the fact that tools you're using today might not be relevant a few months or a year from now. Just like knowing that and being open to that is I think the biggest skill and quality. There's also this interesting thing happening right now where it doesn't matter what you were until like a year or so ago. Like I was a data scientist, someone was a machine learning engineer, someone else could be a software engineer. But all of those are kind of like coalescing into this one persona that's like an AI engineer, which is essentially an engineer who is able to leverage AI as a tool. And I think moving forward, that's kind of where we are going to start seeing that delta where just engineers in general who can like leverage AI on their day-to-day job or to like automate things or make things more efficient probably end up being more successful than folks who are like resisting it or not trying to use those tools. Things are changing so much. People tend to get like some kind of anxiety, the necessity to have to be constantly learning. And it sounds like a really difficult thing. Right. (laughs) What's, What's your advice for people who are maybe a little bit scared of having to always be adapting? I think start small. Like, and and that's me too. Like whenever I start working on like a a project that I have no experience in, like will I be able to do it or not? It's a scary place to be in. But I'd say maybe start small. Like start using these tools in situations where it's not going to have a huge impact, right? Like if you're used to doing Google searches, maybe try using tools like Perplexity or even like ChatGPT. And then once you feel like, okay, like I know how to like interact with these models, then maybe if you're writing code, then start using Copilot kind of tools. So that slow transition from in cases where it doesn't matter to like where it starts making a difference is a nice way to ease yourself into it. That reminds me of another advice that I heard. If you say like plan for the next 10 years, it's mm-hmm. hard to plan. Yeah. But if you say, okay, like think about the next thing you need to do. Yeah. Then you can think about what for to sure. do next. So yeah. you're, th- you're saying like take small steps, whatever your background or knowledge is. Yeah. Do the next thing that you can do. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what what I faced moving into this new role as well. Because like as a data scientist, like I was focused on one thing at a time. But in this role, you want to talk about AI as a whole and what are the different things that you can solve. So my first few weeks, I was like, I need to know every single thing, every new model that comes out, every new technique. I need to know about that. But that's realistically not sustainable. And I, I think that this is a trend as technology you know moves forward yeah it's not just the tech industry right like even if you are a doctor yeah or other fields too technology is changing exactly. every field yeah <laughs> so even For doctors sure. need to keep reading new yeah. research papers so exactly it's not about just working in tech it's just definitely changing that's a really reality point. yeah exactly <laughs> all right guys that was a purba thank you for being here and thank you for watching thanks Bye. for having me <laughs>